So you've watched Ridley Scott's Napoleon and you've got this problem. Where do I go to find a book that tells me what the real history of Napoleon is, the real life of Napoleon, the real legacy of Napoleon? Where do I go to find that? I had this problem myself. I watched the film and I could sense that something was not quite right but i hadn't read a biography of napoleon so i went out and i had a bit of a look try to find some good books to good history books good world history books if possible to really understand the story of napoleon this extraordinary figure before long i realized that there were hundreds not hundreds thousands of books on napoleon how do I choose the right one for me to read today about Napoleon? Well, I'm going to share my thoughts on that with you today so that you can have a bit of a shortcut to choosing the right three quality history books to understand the life, the leadership and the legacy of Napoleon Bonaparte. What biography should I read to understand the life of Napoleon? Napoleon led an absolutely extraordinary life. He was born in an outer province, so to speak, in Corsica. At 25, he's a minor military officer fighting on behalf of the French Revolutionary Government. At 35, just 35 years old, he is emperor of France and uh, 10 or so years later he's exiled first to Saint Helena and then to Elba. There are hundreds of biographies, memoirs, biographical recollections and portraits of Napoleon. There are a dozen or more biographies published in the last 10 years and a lot of you have made recommendations on the Burning Archive channel as to in response to my video on the Ridley Scott movie Napoleon uh, about the books that you would recommend on Napoleon. I'm going to recommend a French biography of Napoleon by Patrice Guinefay, who I might add has actually commented on some of the errors, historical inaccuracies of Ridley Scott's film. Guinefay's biography was hailed as a masterwork when it was published in France in uh, 2014 or 2015. And it has since been translated into English in 2020. And I read it online through a uh, public library. Uh, Patrice has been working on this biography since 2004. So it's a lifetime's work. He published the first volume of two in 2014, 2015, and I hope the second volume will come soon. The first volume takes us up to Napoleon in 1802. It traces Napoleon Bonaparte's early childhood in Corsica, his rise during the Revolutionary Wars, including the scenes in Egypt portrayed in Ridley Scott's uh, uh, film Napoleon and takes us to his uh, proclamation as consul for life, soon to be emperor in 1802. He paints a full nuanced portrait of Napoleon and in a way he tries to resurrect the art of writing biographies of Napoleon which at least he claims had fallen a bit out of fashion in the French historical tradition in recent decades. It is a work of serious scholarship but it is thoughtful and gracefully written and quite engaging, I think. Uh, he discusses the different ways of telling Napoleon's story uh, simply and clearly. Uh, was it an heroic adventure? Was it a fate dictated by necessity? Or was it some sort of combination of both, depending on the storyteller's preferences and values in relationship to the big issues of nation and empire and heroism and war and glory and the impact of the individual 
on historical events. Indeed, that point, the role of an individual, the significance of an individual biography in the great sweep of grand world historical events is one of the key themes of Genefee's book. Uh, the desire to make something of your life will ultimately overcome circumstances, events, and uh, as they used to say, the material conditions of history. And Pinafé argues, I think quite compellingly, that in a way this makes Napoleon uh, relate to everyone's dream. Everyone wants to have an impact on life, if not at quite the same scale as Napoleon. Ginefe writes, Napoleon is a figure of the modern individual that is the subject of this book. Uh, now, I'm only part way through this wonderful book, but it's absolutely on my reading list, my history book reading list plan for 2024. But I do recommend it. Uh, and it's also good to get a French perspective. The second book relates to Napoleon as a leader, his leadership. And Napoleon was without doubt a leader. People felt this at the time. Some admired his leadership. For example, the German poet, author, dictator, great intellectual Goethe, said that Napoleon was in a state of permanent enlightenment. On the other hand, some people despised Napoleon's leadership. Madame de Stael, who is worthy of a video all by herself, uh, wrote after Napoleon's death that Napoleon was a condottieri, like a mercenary soldier from the Italian Renaissance, a condottieri without manners, without fatherland, without morality, an oriental despot, a new Attila, a warrior who knew only how to corrupt and annihilate. Not the most pleasant portrait of him and employing a few tropes about uh, the Mongol horde. As Andrew Roberts wrote, uh, there is a constant debate within the books on Napoleon as to whether Napoleon was a destroyer or an architect, a liberator or a tyrant, a statesman or an adventurer. And indeed, I could have suggested Andrew Roberts' book, uh, Napoleon the Great, uh, on Napoleon's leadership style. He makes the case that Napoleon really was great. But uh, the title kind of gave away the story. Philip Dwyer's Citizen Emperor, Napoleon in Power, 1799-1815, also provides a detailed pack with detailed portrait of this aspect of Napoleon's leadership. Uh, but again, it is not the easiest read. So the book I will recommend, I actually found at the local library. And it is William Nestor, Napoleon and the Art of Leadership. How a flawed genius changed the history of Europe and the world. It may not be the most famous book on Napoleon, but it takes an interesting angle, which I think a lot of viewers uh, who are interested in the figure of Napoleon as a role model, perhaps rather than good or bad, rather than as a uh, like as a history buff, may well relate to. Nesta is an American professor of government and politics, and he explicitly looks at how Napoleon led people in both war and politics. It is an intriguing book, and I jumped to the conclusion and got to uh, his overall assessment. I haven't read it all yet, but I am again planning to in 2024. And the overall assessment is that the genius side of Napoleon dominated really uh, his career until uh, maybe 1807, the high point perhaps of his power, uh, where he concluded with uh, Russia the Treaty of Tilsit, uh, which is actually portrayed in Ridley Scott's film. It's the scene where Napoleon is talking to Tsar Alexander from Russia in a kind of a kind of a tent sort of um, room in a marsh in Tilsit where there's lots of mosquitoes. 
after that point, Napoleon overreached. He uh, overreached in the size of his empire. He attacked both Spain and Russia. He created what uh, uh, Nestor describes using international relations literature as a security dilemma by posing such a threat to other countries that all the other countries started to gang up against him. And most of all, he ultimately overestimated his abilities to control the problems, the fate and the events of the world. Perhaps all leaders do in the end suffer that fate, but Nestor offers some fascinating insights along the way. And Napoleon offers some exemplary stories about what leaders both should and should not do. And for that reason, I think it will be of interest to a lot of people who aren't necessarily history buffs. And that might be you. And if you're liking this video, why don't you give it a thumbs up right now. It will help spread the burning archive my YouTube channel on history, culture, the best books in history, and ways that you can think mindfully about the stories we tell each other about history uh, to a broader audience. I'd love it if you did that right now. The third and final book I'm going to cover in this video uh, relates to Napoleon's legacy. The thing about Napoleon is he just did not shape the history of France. He did not just shape the history of Europe. He shaped the history of the whole world. He shaped global, not alone and not solely as a result of his actions. There were many other causes for the things that happened during the Napoleonic era. But he did give his name to a time, the Napoleonic era. And he gave his name to a set of wars, the Napoleonic Wars, that uh, was perhaps the greatest known human conflict in world history up to that point, and at that time was known as the Great War. So his legacy, Napoleon's legacy, can't just be seen from a French perspective or a British perspective or even a American perspective. It needs to be seen in a much bigger world history perspective. And there is a great book by Alexander Mika Brezzi, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, which was published in 2020. That does exactly that. And if I just read from uh, this fine book, he notes that though provoked by the rivalries within Europe, the Napoleonic Wars involved worldwide struggles for colonies and trade, and in scale, reach and intensity, they represent one of the largest conflicts in history. In his efforts to achieve French hegemony, Napoleon indirectly became the architect of independent South America, reshaped the Middle East, strengthened British imperial ambitions, and Britain was just about everywhere, including dear old Australia, and contributed to the rise of American power. As well as the well-known conflicts in Waterloo or Austerlitz, there were decisive events in Napoleon's career, in Napoleon's legacy, in Buenos Aires, in New Orleans, in Queenstown Heights, in Ruse, in Aslandos, Asav, Macau, Orove, and Alexandria. Among the impacts of Napoleon's legacy highlighted in this excellent book uh, are the consolidation of the British Empire in India, Russian expansion in Finland, Poland and the Pacific Northeast. The competition between three European empires in North America, French Canada, French America. The author points out that uh, the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s uh, which was negotiated by Napoleon with the new uh, 13 colonies of the United States of America, doubled the 
extent of the United States. It was an enormous step, I guess, in the history of, the, of America. And it also gave that country, that new fledgling country, a much greater resource base and capacity to resist the British when again they fought in 1812. There was also the Caribbean Haitian Rebellion, uh, the largest of the Atlantic slave revolts. There was the occupation of Spain in 1808, which led to the disintegration of the Spanish Empire in South America. It had impacts on the Philippines and also in the development of new liberal political institutions uh, in Europe and in the Americas. And there were also upheavals in Iran, emulating Napoleon in Iran and Egypt. South Africa, Japan, China and Indonesia were also affected by the Napoleonic Wars. This was not just some European squabble. It had global historical significance. And the author writes that the Napoleonic Wars were above all a European conflict, but they shaped Europe's relationship with the rest of the world. This conflict both compelled and encouraged European states to undergo a painful process of reform and modernization, which changed the balance of forces between different parts of the globe. It was a crucial set of events in that great hinge of history between 1800 and 1830 when the West rose to dominate the world. Napoleon, as much as the Industrial Revolution or, or, or Anglo-American political traditions, uh, is a central player in the story of the West. This is really a brilliant, brilliant book. Uh, you can buy it online uh, or at good bookshops, or you can read it for free uh, at a public library like I did. Now, all these books are long. Uh, they all serious works of scholarship, but they're all also readable. There is quite a bit of argument and detail, but you don't have to read them all to grasp the essential concepts, to grasp the lines of the story. Uh, read as much as you like to answer your curiosity. But these three books, Patrice Guinefez, Napoleon, William Nestor, Napoleon and the Art of Leadership, and Alexander Mikabridzi, The Napoleonic Wars, A Global History, will satisfy your curiosity about Napoleon in a way that Ridley Scott failed to do. And what is more, as a special bonus, I've provided links in the description below to some YouTube uh, video appearances of these authors so you can get a bit of a taste for their books uh, independent of me, but get a bit of a feel for the type of arguments that they present in their books, if, especially if you can't get immediate access to any of these books. But before you go, make sure you subscribe if you're at all curious about what I will share with you next about world history, quality books, and the cultures of the world. And you might even want to check out one of the other videos of mine that YouTube is sharing with you now.